Amen. Let me encourage you to grab your Bibles with me and turn to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, it's uh, been a while and um, it's uh, good now to get back into the gospel of Mark. I, I'm always encouraging you to, um, when you're in a text of scripture, to remember um, not only where you are within, within that text, but then also within that chapter and then within that book of the Bible that you're reading and then where that book is located within the um, greater trajectory of the entire Bible. And so my fear is, is that on a day like today, when we just kind of, uh, we've been out of Mark for a little while, and then we kind of jump back in, that as we're reading this, um, this account, this, this story, this interaction between Jesus and his disciples, and between Jesus and this um, father, and between Jesus and this boy that is demon-possessed, that we will lose sight of um, the, the story within its greater context. And so we must not do that. So um, let me remind you from, I don't know, a month ago, three weeks ago, whatever it's been, that that Jesus has, has just come off of uh, the, what's called the Mount of Transfiguration. And this is where Jesus takes uh, his three closest disciples up on the mountain. And, um, and, and as it were, he, he peels back his humanity a bit and lets his godness uh, shine through. So we affirm that, and the Bible teaches, that Jesus is fully God and fully man. He is fully God, yet veiled in human flesh. And so on the Mount of Transfiguration, um, his humanity is peeled back and his godness radiates um, from out of his person. And so that's where we were. Now, with that, I want to also remind you of another mountain, because this is going to come back, another mountain, not the Mount of Transfiguration, but rather a mountain called Sinai. And you read about this in the Old Testament. And, and, on, the, um, and on Mount Sinai, there's, a, there, there's another one who goes up the mountain. This time it is Moses. And on the mountain... Moses receives uh, the law from God, um, and and he walks back down. His face uh, shines uh, brightly uh, because it is reflecting the glory of God that he has just beheld. And he comes down the mountain with the law under his arm, as it were, and he walks down into, do you remember what what he walks down into? An epic party that is not good. Where, where God's worship leader Aaron is directing God's people in idol worship of a golden calf. And if you remember the first commandment, it goes something like, don't have any other gods before me, and they are bowing down to a golden image. So Moses goes from this mountain... Where he, um, uh, where he experiences the glory of God back down into the chaos of uh, the real world, in a sense. And so, keep that picture in mind as we watch Jesus come down off of a mountain, experiencing the glory and the revelation of his Father, and walks back down into a lot of chaos. So let's read this text together, then I'm going to pray, then we're going to get to work. Mark chapter 9 and verse 14 And when they came to the disciples, that's Jesus in the three, come back down to reconnect with the other guys. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about? And someone from the crowd answered, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they weren't able to. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can... All things are possible for one who believes. 
immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. The boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. So Father, it is appropriate now and most appropriate for us to turn to you in prayer. And God, not, not to turn to you in prayer and confess our self-reliance and our independence, but rather to turn to you in prayer and confess that we are here for you. We are not here to rely on ourselves, God. We cannot rely on ourselves. It is a dangerous and a damning exercise. Father, let us look to you. And as we look to you, God, would you move mightily in this room, in our lives, in our hearts. Father, might we see this son of yours who you have sent into the world. God, not just a son who walks down off of a mountain into chaos, but a son who would leave heaven and come to earth. Come to the chaos of earth and not sit back and scoff at the mess that we have gotten ourselves into but rather one who enters into the mess and in his good and gracious sovereignty to us chooses to do something about it. So we praise you. Show us your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Mark chapter 9 and in verse 14 you you would note that there is a strange absence around what the other disciples have been up to while the three and Jesus are up on the mountain. The reason there's a strange absence is is because um, Peter is the source of, is the eyewitness source for this gospel. Mark has his name on it. Peter's the source. Peter's up on the mountain with Jesus, kind of putting his foot in his mouth a bit and then walking back down. And now we are... um, we are now confronted with the activities of the other disciples, and this is what we find. They come down off the mountain, and there's a great crowd around the other disciples, and there's scribes arguing with them. So that's the situation that the disciples are in. And when the crowd sees Jesus, they they immediately, when they see him, are greatly amazed and run up to him and they greet him. And now you go from this chaotic picture of all of this mayhem to now all eyes are on Jesus. And that is the way that it should be, by the way. All eyes are on Jesus. And Jesus asks a question. What are you arguing about with them? Now, I don't know if there's a pause here while the disciples figure out who's going to speak on behalf of this uh, group of, of, of hard-hearted men or, or what. But maybe there's no pause. But some, a voice, not one of the disciples, kind of comes flying in from the back. And the voice says, Teacher, I brought my son to you. For he has, or because, he has a spirit, a demon, that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So, here's the source of the argument. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. So can you get that picture in your mind? This this man with this boy says, Teacher, I brought my son to you. But Jesus is up on the mountain. And so, so his, his representatives, his disciples are there. And so, so the man brings his son to the disciples and the disciples are unable to cast out the demon. And, and, and the scribes who hate Jesus and hate his followers pounce on an opportunity to defame the name of Jesus 
by pointing out the obvious fact that his disciples are unable to do anything about the demon. And so this reflects poorly on the disciples as this great crowd is around now watching the mayhem of this argument, and it reflects, by extension, poorly on Jesus. And so the father brings the boy to get help, and ends up not having his boy helped to this point, and instead gets to watch some sort of theological kind of posturing and argumentation going on between the guys who are supposed to be helping and the other guys who can't help. Namely, the disciples who are supposed to be helping and the scribes who have never helped anyone but themselves. And here he is caught up in this. Jesus comes down the mountain. All eyes go to him. The Father goes to Jesus. And here we have the interaction. Jesus, before turning to the Father, hears the news of this and says, verse 19, O faithless generation, How long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Jesus has, and we've seen this continually, been confronted by and confronted the disciples on the hardness of their hearts. The the, the crowd is unbelieving, more more therefore a spectacle in a sense. The disciples we see are are remaining with some unbelief in, in their own hearts. And so Jesus, out of the anguish of being so misunderstood, out of the anguish of seeing the, 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 the difficulty of the of overcoming unbelief and the hardness of heart, he says these words, and then. He turns to the Father and he says, bring him to me. Verse 20, and they brought the boy to him. And when the Spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Now Jesus does an interesting thing here, and you may not catch it if you're not careful. He doesn't immediately cast out the demon. He doesn't immediately turn his attention to the boy, but rather he sees the condition of the boy and does what? Turns his attention back to the father. Why does he do that? Well, he's going to ask the father a question. Here's the question. How long has this been happening to him? Now, what you have here is you have Jesus engaging the father. You see, the father thinks that his biggest problem is is that his son is... is, um, possessed by a demon. But actually, when the father says, um, I, I, um, please help us, us, plural, when the father says that, um, he, he doesn't probably know that he has a greater need or as great a need even as his demon-possessed boy. And so Jesus now, rather than jumping immediately into healing the boy, is going to engage the father. And so he says, how long has this been happening to him? And the father says, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. Now, one of the things that I have at times periodically encouraged you to do is to feel the text. And what I mean by feel the text is put yourself there. Get yourself there. I whether you have children or not, get yourself there. Get yourself into the shoes of this father who has watched his boy be oppressed and possessed by this demon for his entire life. Get yourself there. Look at this boy through the eyes of a father who watches his son be oppressed by this evil demon who clearly is only out to destroy him, the boy who cannot hear, who cannot speak, get yourself there. Feel that. Feel that angst and that sorrow in this man. And and here he he runs to Jesus for help, but Jesus isn't there because he's up on a mountain. And he turns to to Jesus' representatives, his disciples, to help him. And the disciples aren't able to. And and now he gets to sit back and watch this argument as the disciples and the scribes focus on each other rather than focus on on helping the Father and helping 
his son. And so Jesus asks a great question. How long has this been happening to him? Do you know why? Because Jesus is going to get into the man's shoes. Jesus is going to get into his shoes and Jesus is going to draw out of this father. He's going to draw him out. And we're going to see... We're going to see Jesus give this father what he desperately needs. Watch. If, verse 22, end of verse 22, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. You see that? Now, when the Father says, have compassion on us and help us, here's what I think he means. What I think he means is, is that Jesus, my boy is hurting, therefore I am hurting, so help us. But, but what Jesus is actually going to do is he is going to both help the boy and the Father by, by drawing out the, the faith of the Father and by healing the boy. So, so watch him do this. If you can do anything, help us. Now watch Jesus, verse 23. And Jesus said to him, if you can. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but back in Mark chapter 1, Jesus runs into a leper. And it's verse 40 if you want to read it. And, and, in, and in this, the leper comes to Jesus and essentially says, Jesus could help me, but would he? So Jesus, I believe that you have the power to help, but will you? Are you willing? Now what you see here is the inverse of that. Here's a father who's coming to Jesus and saying, I I believe Jesus would help me, but but can he? Is he able to? Now think about this. This father has seen the demonstration of the power of the kingdom of darkness for the entire life of his boy. He's watched the demon do all of these terrible, just wreak terrible havoc in in the life of his son. And he's watched the demon do it almost unhindered. The only thing that that the demon has been hindered from doing is, is actually killing the boy. Other than that, he's had his way with him. And so the father has, has in very, uh, very um, clear reality seen the power of the kingdom of darkness. And, and so here he's saying, Jesus, listen, I've heard, I've heard about your miracles. I've heard you can do this. But, but the reality of the father's life is, is that what he's seen from the kingdom of darkness appears to be more powerful, more potent, greater than what he hopes Jesus is able to do. So Jesus, I think you have the compassion to heal my boy, but I'm not sure that you have the power. Jesus says, if you can, exclamation point, you see that, all things are possible for one who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Cried out, like, like some manuscripts, cried out with tears. Like, like desperation. Like, like, Jesus, I don't have anywhere else to go. Like, Jesus, I believe. I wouldn't be here if I didn't. But help my unbelief. That is some beautiful honesty right there. That is as as beautiful a picture of faith as you are going to find in the Bible. Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief. Now I will make this observation because it must be made. Suffering has an interesting ability to strip away all of the facades and the posturing and the airbrushing that we Christians tend to walk around with. The majority of our time, and God help us, but the majority of our time as Christians is spent posturing and showing how much faith we actually have trying to control the perception of those around us, it is actually, I've found experientially and biblically more importantly than that, it is only in suffering when we set aside the facade and just let ourselves be seen and be known as who we actually are. And here the Father says, Jesus, I believe, but to be honest with you, there's more unbelief in my heart right now than there is belief. I believe, but help my unbelief. 
that, counter to what we may have picked up on, on the fringes of Christendom, that is actual saving faith. That's actual faith. The, the kind of false faith that we walk around in is, is that we always want to demonstrate uh, how much faith we actually have and how good we actually are and how much together we actually have. And all it requires is the winds of chaos and suffering to come into our lives until we realize just how small we actually are. And the reason I tell you that Jesus has come not only to help the boy, but to also help the father, is that the, boy, or is that the father needs to know that he may have a small amount of faith and a lot of lingering doubts and unbelief, but his small amount of faith is placed into the right object, and the result of that is that small faith in the great object, namely Jesus, can accomplish some really, really beautiful things. And so, I jotted these things down rather briefly as I've thought through this text. Some markers of true faith. I have four of them. You jot these down. Go study them out. See if they are true. True faith. Number one. I'm taking this just from this example of this father who loves his boy. Number one. True faith sees its smallness. True faith sees its smallness. If you walk around and continually marvel at the quantity, at the size of your faith, and you tell others about how much faith you have, I, I just have some news for you. You're headed to hell. You're headed to hell. True faith in Christ does not marvel at how great your faith is. Rather, it marvels at the greatness of your Savior and the comparative smallness of the faith that you have placed into Him. I came across some dangerous teaching accidentally on the back half of, um, of my college years and as I was beginning to head into ministry. And the teaching I didn't know at the time kind of... Um, its origins are actually called the Word of Faith movement. And you have teachers in this movement, the one in particular that I had um, really listened to a lot early on, where, where essentially the, 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 the guy would say often that he never gets sick, that, that he never even has a sniffle. Um, and the reason for that is, is because he has so much faith. And, and, and so if you are sick, you have migraines, you have this, you have that, then all you need to do is get more faith. Now, the problem is, is I look back on that now and I go, what a bunch of garbage. But at the time, I hadn't been reading my Bible a ton. And this guy always had a Bible open when he would teach. So I remember when I was getting ready for the Marine Corps, which I didn't end up I messed up my knee anyway, longer story, but point is, I'm, I'm doing pull-ups, and I remember um, tweaking something in my neck and having maybe the worst pain, like brought me to my knees kind of pain and the ensuing migraine headache that, that lasted a, a couple of days after that. Couldn't sleep, pew, I mean, just terrible. And, and because of this guy's influence in my life, I'm, I'm not only struggling through the pain of a migraine, but I'm also then absolutely obliterating myself over the fact that if I just had enough faith, I, I wouldn't have this migraine anymore. I started reading my Bible and realized that that is a bunch of garbage. A bunch of garbage. I came back across this guy a couple of weeks ago, actually, accidentally. I was hoping that he would have gotten fired by now, but lo and behold, it appears as though his following has become greater. And I, and, and I listened to him on YouTube telling people that if, um, that, that if they had more faith, they wouldn't get COVID. And, uh, and actually, that because he has so much faith, he can go into a crowd of people who all have COVID, I don't know how he would know that, and heal them merely by his presence. And so he, and, and like, listen, like, you can't even make that up. You can't even make that up. But I'm, I want to point this out because some of us are, are where I was. And you're buying into that. And you're going, man, if I just had more faith, if I just had more faith, if I just had more faith. It's called the Word of Faith movement for a reason, but it's absolute rubbish. It is not biblical. The, the, the beautiful faith that we see in the Bible does not marvel at its quantity. It does not marvel at its own depth. Rather, it marvels at the direction. If the direction of your faith, small though it may be, is aimed at Jesus Christ, then, then mountains can be moved. And if it's 
a lot of faith aimed somewhere other than him, it won't matter. It will lead you to hell. That's Jesus' point when he says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. The point is, is a microscopic amount of faith placed into Jesus Christ, surrounded by all kinds of doubts and wonderings and unbelief, still can move mountains or alter trajectories for eternity. And so, true faith sees its smallness. Second, true faith takes no confidence in self. True faith takes no confidence in itself. You see that the problem that we're about to unearth with the disciples is, is that they were confident in themselves rather than dependent on God. If you have faith, your confidence rests in your Savior, not in you. And that must be said because our culture is one of self-dependence. Depend on you. You got this. You can do this. You this, you that. That is all counter to the gospel. The gospel says we have no confidence in self. Number three, true faith sees a desperate need for Jesus. A continual, ongoing, desperate need for Jesus. The kind of need for Jesus that says, I will will crawl through this crowd, I will listen to this argument, I will do whatever I must do, but I must get to Jesus. I need Jesus. Now, if you're not careful, you think, well, if I have faith, I I put my faith into Christ and then I go off and do other things. That is not biblical. Instead, it's I place my faith into Christ and I keep my faith in Christ and I don't ever leave Christ and I don't need Christ any less today than I did yesterday. In fact, I'm more aware of my great need for Him. I need Him. And so it could be said that there are two kinds of people in the world. Those who need Him and those who need Him. I grew up in a church that taught there's two kinds of people in the world. Those who have Jesus and and those who need to have Jesus. That's not true. I need Jesus as much today as my unbelieving atheist neighbor needs Jesus. I desperately need Him. If He does not hold me and keep me, I, I will not stay the course. I need Him. And you do too. And occasionally, and most often through profound suffering, God is gracious enough to remind you of how desperately you need him. And it hurts, yet there is a sweetness to it because the airbrushed facade of self-reliance and self-dependence goes away and you rest in him. Number four, finally on this, true faith is, is and, and is marked by an unconditional openness to God. That's James Edwards who says that. And the point there is, is that true faith does not come to God with your own set of conditions that He must meet. Rather, true faith comes to God with your conditions and surrenders those to Him. Kind of like Jesus in the garden, looking at the white hot cup of God's wrath and saying, God, I... I Do not want to drink of that cup. But if that is the only way that it can be done, then I will surrender my will to yours. I will surrender my will to yours. So we see those markers of true faith by the example of this father. Now we finish out the story. I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, so the the crowd is getting bigger and getting more riled up, He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and don't ever enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. You know what that demon just tried to do? The demon without words said, Jesus, if I'm coming out of him, I'm taking him with me. Now, Jesus is about to grab this boy and raise him up. But I don't know, and neither do you, how long it went from the boy falling dead on the ground as the demon said, I'm going to get him. If I'm going, I'm taking him with me. I don't know how long it took from, from laying on the ground as though dead, looked like a corpse, to Jesus raising him up. But in the heart of a father, 
It had to feel like an eternity. And in the heart of a father, a father says this, and so does the rest of the crowd. This has gotten worse. As the father is grappling with the reality that the demon has left, but also taken his boy with him, the father must be thinking, well, at least when the demon was here, I had my son. Now, I don't have my son anymore. So things have gotten worse. Or so it seems. But, so the crowd says he is dead. Verse 27. But, Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. You know what that says, in the, how that reads in the Greek? It reads like this. Jesus took him by the hand, raised him up, and he was resurrected. Now let me, let me remind you of a conversation that Jesus had coming down the Mount of Transfiguration. It went like this. Boys, don't tell anyone what you just saw until after the Son of Man dies and is resurrected. And you know what the disciples did? They kept it to themselves. You know what else they did? They asked each other and pondered and wondered. This is um, verse 10 of Mark chapter 9. What's it look like? What does it mean to be raised from the dead? You know what Jesus just did? He answered the question. This is what it looks like to be raised from the dead. Boy, take him by the hand. Get up. He raises him up. And the boy was resurrected. However, you must know that this will not be the last time that Jesus demonstrates what a resurrection looks like. The boy is restored to the Father and the disciples entered the house. The disciples asked Him privately, Jesus, why couldn't we cast Him out? And He said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Now you got to be careful here because that doesn't mean that there are some demons who you can cast out who don't require prayer and some do. What, what Jesus is saying is, it's clearer in the Greek, but what He's saying is, is that this kind of conflict, this kind of spiritual combat cannot be done apart from prayer. Can't be done apart from prayer. So, so think about this. He, here's, here's, what, here's what's happened. What, what's, what's happened is, is is that Jesus commissions the disciples and He sends them out. This happened earlier in the Gospel of Mark. He sent them out. And you know what they did? They cast out demons and they raised the dead and they healed the sick and they did all of that. And so, so that happened. Now, Jesus heads up on the mountain with the three and the other guys are left down, down here. And you can kind of, you need to get yourself there. So here's the remaining disciples. They're waiting for the guys to come back. They're waiting for Jesus to come back. And here comes a father. You take one look at his son and you go, something's not right here. Looks like he's been burned a bunch of times, all kinds of scars. Looks like he's, he's not quite aware of, of where he is because he can't hear and he can't talk. You look at his dad and you go, he's been through some stuff. And the father walks up to the disciples with his boy and he's looking for Jesus, but Jesus isn't there. And the disciples go, oh, this is no problem. I've done this before. I did, Jesus said, I can do this. And so they do whatever they used to do. And nothing happens. And the next one steps up and, and he tries and nothing happens. And the next one and he tries and nothing happens. And you see the face of a father fall. And the boy who doesn't know what's going on anyway and no one can help. And now a crowd begins to gather. And pretty soon the scribes show up and the disciples keep trying and nothing's happening and the Father's face falls some more. And what you have going on here, and you must see this is, is that the disciples 
are resting in their own giftedness, their own calling, their own skill set, their own knowledge in order to advance the kingdom of God while forgetting a very, very important lesson, and it's this. The kingdom of light does not advance apart from radical and ferocious dependence on God. That's what prayer is, by the way. Prayer is, I have gotten myself into something that I am unable to get myself out of. Jesus, help me. And so that's what he means by this, this ain't coming out by anything other than prayer. The kingdom will only advance under men and women who are radically devoted to depending on God to use them and do with them what they otherwise could never ever do themselves. And if you walk around in your life kind of thinking, I've got this, I have news for you. You don't, and life will soon demonstrate that to you. You and I need help. Now, it wasn't until I thought about this text for three weeks or a month or whatever it's been and really thought about it and got back from my trip and got back from being sick and got back from a lot of things, read it again, and and was struck by this reality. Jesus, this is what I said to myself, Jesus, that's risky. That's risky. That's risky to invite these disciples to pray. Do you know why? Because Jesus' whole aim here is to, is to encourage the faith of a father and to see the faith of these disciples be, begin to become realized. And you know how he wants to do it? One of the ways is he wants to invite them to pray. And I said, that's risky, boy. Because if you've ever prayed for anything, then you've been disappointed. If you've ever prayed for anything, you've gotten no. And Jesus knows that his disciples are sometimes going to hear a no. And yet there's something about even them hearing no that can strengthen their faith. How does that work? And right now as a church family, we're grieving with the Goodrow family at the loss of of Jason. Early 40s, loves Jesus, loves his wife, gets news months ago that he's got cancer. You know what we all started doing? We all started praying. Like our lives depended on it. Asking God to heal him. You know what God's answer was? Not in this life. Not in this life. And my point to you is, is that if you are a thinker, you think about Jesus' invitation to pray is so that his followers' faith will be furthered and strengthened and you go, I don't know how that works. And that's because you're not thinking about the fact that that, that prayer is not so much about getting the outcome that you desire, but rather prayer is stepping into God's will, surrendering yours to his, and watching him work situations out, not always in the way that you would have wanted, but in the exact way that he, in his kind, good, gracious sovereignty, has asked them to go. And so as I stand up here yesterday preaching the funeral of this brother, my faith is encouraged as I am thinking about Jason being in the very presence of God, healed and whole, more alive now than he has ever been. I'm reminded of the good shepherd who walked down into the valley of the shadow of death, grabbed hold of Jason and brought Jason out the other side. It, did, the, did my prayers, were my prayers answered in the way I wanted them to be? No. Is God still good? Yes. And until you grapple with a God who is so good that sometimes he will say no to you, even in the greatest pain of your life, until you grapple with that, you're not ready to pray. And that's a lot of our problem, is prayer is a scary endeavor, because what if it doesn't go the way that we want it to? Listen, God is not so small. He is not so small as to be up in heaven wringing his hands, wondering what the outcome of your prayer request is going to be. 
And it is precisely in wrestling, in begging, in pleading, in crying that he transforms your heart more into the image of his son. And that's why it's good to pray prayers that God will always answer. Like, Father, heal Jason Goodrow. And you know what he did? He healed him. In the way that we wanted, no. In the way that we were asking, no. But he's healed nonetheless. And so, you must, if you are going to take the Bible seriously, you must grapple with things like that. You must ask yourself, how does prayer strengthen faith when I don't get the answer that I wanted? And the answer to that is rest in a sovereign God. You must. Now, it's vitally important, and we are nearly done. It is vitally important that you locate this account with this run-in with this father, this argument between the disciples and the scribes, this boy who gets healed. You must locate that within its greater context. And when you do that, you read previous to this that Jesus was, was up on a mountain, and you read after this, right after this, will be there next week, that Jesus is headed to death. Death. He's headed to Calvary. And so in that, you come up with this. It's, I'm not trying to be clever. In that, you, you locate this account within a, a mount of transfiguration and a hill called Calvary. That, that, that's where this falls in. And, and when you do that, you, you must see, you must see this, that there is... There is many, many... Beautiful reminders, we'll put it that way, that the Mount of Transfiguration and this now Valley of Chaos point us to things like this. First of all, that this is the kingdom of darkness versus the kingdom of light. That up on the mountain we saw a tremendous display of kingdom power as Jesus peels it back and shows who he is. And now he walks down in the kingdom of darkness, comes at him, and guess what? The kingdom of light drives out the kingdom of darkness. Jesus says to the demon, that boy is mine. Leave and don't ever come back. And guess what happens? The demon listens because they always do. You see... That, that Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy, but that Jesus has come. It, next chapter, we're going to see this. To give his life as a ransom for many. You, you see that, that this strong man that we're introduced to in Mark chapter 3, this strong man has, has bound up this boy, but that Jesus has come in order to bind up the strong man. You see, as you locate this account in the broader context of Mark, that the fight that Jesus picked with the devil in Mark chapter 1, it's still raging. And Jesus is going to go to a cross. But listen, none of this is accidental. None of this is happenstance. None of this is Jesus happens to come down the mountain and stumble upon a broken-hearted father and a demon-possessed boy. It is all gracious, kind, predetermined sovereignty. And in that, you locate even this, even in Mark, even in the greater trajectory of the Bible, and you're reminded that the fight that Jesus picked with the devil in Mark chapter 1, that wasn't accidental either. In fact, you trace it all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, where, where God called the shot and said, I, I'm going to send someone who's going to crush the head of you, um, of you serpent, of you father of lies. I'm going to send one who's going to crush your head. And from there you start to trace out the trajectory and if you're wondering how it ends well I'll let the Apostle Paul tell you Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15 God has disarmed the demonic rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ on the cross I'll read it again God has disarmed the demonic rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ on the cross do you see that? What you have here 
is you have no mere man who is coincidentally, accidentally walking down a mountain to run into a demon-possessed boy. That is not what you have going on here. What you have going on here is you have God bringing about the cosmic struggle that must happen against the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And what you have is, is you have a king who is dressed for war, walking down this mountain to confront evil, to demonstrate his power over evil, but we're not done yet because then he's going to head to a hill called Calvary and he is going to, it would appear, succumb to the kingdom of darkness. It will appear for three days as though the kingdom of darkness is going to triumph over the kingdom of light. It will appear as though God wasn't as powerful as he pretended to be and though Satan got the upper hand until well until that one fateful morning when the stone blows up and Jesus walks back out of the grave. And Paul says that in walking back out of the grave, Jesus put the devil to open shame. Now, it's one thing to get a butt whooping in secret. Most of us try to keep that to ourselves. It's another thing when, when on a global level, you posture yourself against God and you seemingly win and you celebrate only three days later only to find out that it was precisely in the thing that you thought would end it that actually began all of it. Why? Why? Well, because when Jesus says to the boy, stand up, rise up, be resurrected, well, right after that, then Jesus is going to die and God's going to say, son of mine, rise up, be resurrected. And that is a foreshadowing of the day that God calls out to all of his sons and daughters and says to all of them, rise up, be resurrected. And then what happens is, trace that all the way out, and here is this king who is dressed for war, who gathers his people to himself, and takes us to heaven, where there is no more weeping, sorrow, mourning, or tears. My point to you is this. You see this king? You see this son? You see what he has done? Look to Him. Look to Him. You cannot help but look to Him, see Him, and have a little bit of faith show up in you. A little bit of trust show up in you. Is there going to be unbelief in there? Absolutely. God's going to figure that out and work that out with you later. But you see this Son, and you look at Him, and you find that He is trustworthy. You find that you can place your faith and your trust in Him. And so if you have already done that, I pray that God increases your faith this morning, increases your trust this morning in His Son. And if you've never done that, I pray that God draws you to Himself because this Son of His is trustworthy. Father, we praise You.